So let's get started, hey? Uh, today we're talking about insulin resistance and mainly because I did a uh, uni assignment on it recently, so I had all this stuff together, but it's okay, it's fine. This is good for, um, for content for you guys and I thought that I would put this out on the podcast anyway because it's interesting. So, and I'm also gonna record this and put it on YouTube for those of you who wanna see my face, right? So to start off with, to understand insulin resistance, we need to understand how the body deals with sugar. Uh, basically, there's two, um, there's two hormones that deal with sugar balance in the body. And uh, one of them is insulin and the other is glucagon. When a horse eats meal or eats food, uh, it's, you know, the digestive system, um, you know, takes in that food, breaks it down, breaks down the sugar, the sugar goes into the bloodstream. When there's high levels of sugar in the blood, this uh, makes a sig the, 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 it signals the pancreas to release insulin. And the insulin is the hormone that tells the body to pack away the sugar out of the bloodstream to normalize this, the sugar levels in the bloodstream and to, to pack it away and store it for later use. In, uh, in the tissues. So, and then glucagon is the hormone that when there's low blood sugar levels and there's not enough blood sugar uh, in the body to meet the demands of the, of, you know, metabolics or the demands of the cells, uh, glucagon is the hormone that's released from the pancreas to tell the body to unpack that sugar from where it stored it before and put it back into the bloodstream so that the cells can use it. Um, the, the fed state when a horse is fed, that's their insulin release state. And when they're fasted or they've not had a meal or they don't have food in front of them, that's their glucagon release. Uh, that's their fasted state. So that's where they release glucagon. So tissues that respond to insulin um, are the liver, skeletal muscle, fat tissue. And uh, insulin has other, you know, other functions. Uh, including, you know, in cell replication, DNA synthesis, um, and reducing lipogenesis, which is fat generation. Um, is there much else I can tell you about that? That's a, that's basic, right? So um, that's a basic. That okay? They're, they're in the, the two hormones work in concert with each other to to keep your blood sugar levels uh, at a consistent state. With insulin resistance, it's considered a type of metabolism and it's also known as equine metabolic syndrome. So it was only fairly recently recognized in horses around 15-ish years ago, maybe a little bit longer. And in horses with insulin resistance, um, there's often a normal level of blood glucose uh, circulating in the body, but a high level of insulin when they're tested. So the tissues that are meant to store the glucose become way less sensitive to insulin over time, right? So this causes the pancreas to have to release even more levels, like even more insulin to get the same response in the cells to pack away that sugar and to maintain, you know, uh, sugar level balance in the blood. And chronically high insulin levels can cause inflammation and enzyme dysfunction throughout the body with some really negative impacts, which I'll go on, I'll go into a little bit later. We'll get to that. Um, and also in insulin resistant horses, there's, um, there's also in, uh, quite, a, quite commonly they'll have a problem with leptin as well, which is a hormone that controls appetite. So they'll be resistant to that hormone as well. So like, Insulin resistant horses are those ones that you think are, you know, they're just always hungry, always looking for something to eat, always um, really food motivated. They'll, and they'll tend to overeat as well, which can, you know, have impacts moving forward, you know, yeah, on obesity and whatnot. Um, insulin resistance, the, the roots to the cause of this is based, is mainly genetic. So it's common in pony breeds you know, miniature horses, um, Morgans, Arabs, um, though, you know, those kind of, th those breeds of horses. And there's also the theory of the thrifty gene hypothesis. So say that three times quickly. Good luck to you. 
thrifty gene hypothesis. I quite often will uh, stumble over that one. So basically that's the, th that's the hypothesis where, um, you know, horses evolved without a calorie dense food source. And this gene was thought to be an advantage to horses in those times. Um, but with our modern horses being kept in, uh, you know, small paddocks and being fed, calorie dense meals rather than grazing consistently throughout the day. Uh, this thrifty gene that causes them to be able to, you know, live off the smell of an oily rag is what, you know, what us horse people have always said, this, this horse lives off the smell of an oily rag. So um, the gene, it, like it doesn't help them in, in a domestic situation. Um, it's generally related to obesity uh, in these animals that are like genetically predisposed to insulin resistance. Um, also for insulin resistance, causative factors, um, magnesium, magnesium deficiency can also be a situ like an issue with them. Um, because horses, again, they evolved in areas with high magnesium, they have a high requirement. So, um, and also one of the functions with magnesium, like it, it, it has a function with uh, sugar balance in the body. So, that can be an, an issue as well. So I also read in a few different sources, especially Eleanor Kellen says, um, like has done a little bit of research into this, iron overload can be an issue with insulin resistance. So it's well documented in other species like humans and whatnot. And, you know, preliminary studies suggest the same issue exists in these insulin resistant horses. So, but it's generally considered a cofactor and not like a primary cause of the disease. The primary cause is, is genetic. It, you know, they have a genetic predisposition and then you know, the, the mismanagement of these animals throughout their life will lead to insulin resistance um, becoming, um, you know, uh, becoming recognizable in these horses, like the symptoms become recognizable. Uh, the clinical signs, so you'll see these horses will have recurrent laminitis or laminitic episodes. It's usually associated with pasture or seasonal laminitis with these insulin resistant horses. Um, a lot of the horses will suffer from chronic low grade subclinical laminitis as well. So they might not have a, like a clinical laminitis episode, but these guys have got the thin soles, they've got the stretch lamina, they've got, um, you know, their footy, you know, the, these are the types of horses that tend to need, like people say, oh, you know, it needs protection, he needs shoes or boots or whatever to be able to do any work or even live in his paddock. Um, that's what these guys present as. So that's like the primary, the primary issue with insulin resistance is the laminitis. Um, hormonal clinical signs as well, so that you can find that there's infertility in mares, enlarged udders. Um, these horses are generally have low energy you know, not that they're lethargic per se, but you know, that the, the, if you saw them galloping in the paddock, you'd think, oh, that's unusual. Um, you know, that, and not necessarily related to age. Like, you know, you can have a seven year old horse with insulin resistance that's just happy to plot around the paddock, you know. And then what's really classical about insulin resistant horses are they've got these like fatty deposits around their body. So it's like, it's inappropriate fat. And I'm sure you've seen it. So, you know, um, the occipital, um, like the, like the hole above the eye, uh, that will, instead of it being a hollow, it'll, it'll be, look like it's quite full of fat. Um, they'll have a cresty neck, sometimes really hard. Like uh, if you're watching on the YouTube, I've got a picture of a horse with a cresty neck uh, here. Um, they will have fatty deposits around their tail head. You know, geldings will have fat around their sheath and then the, and they'll also carry fat in the area behind their shoulders, like around the wither and the shoulder. And it can quite often, it, it can even look, especially if they get quite obese, these areas will look like cellulite sometimes. And even, um, you know, you'll get these horses, these obese insulin resistant horses to lose weight. And they'll still have, like, they'll have ribs showing, but sometimes, not all the time, but they will still have these fatty deposits along the neck and the tail head especially. Um, and you think, well, this horse has lost so much weight. Why does it still look fat? But really it's, it's this, it's this, this, you know, inappropriate um, deposition of fat that the body is, is having to do because of the uncontrolled insulin resistance. 
Um, like I said, laminitis is the main like problem with insulin resistance because of the like the the welfare issue with horses like laminitis is painful right it's a welfare issue to have this to have your horse have a laminitic episode every year in the spring or when you get a flush of grass and it's and it's it's it needs to be managed generally these horses tend to be diagnosed because of the repeated laminitic episodes and you know the vet and the farrier and the owner are trying to figure out why what why the laminitis is happening um, you know, looking out for subclinical signs of laminitis, like, you know, a stretch lamina line, thin or even a convex sole, so the sole will look like it's almost bulging, uh, event lines that are wider at the heels than they are at the dorsal aspect or the toe of the foot. Um, these kind of subclinical signs, you know, they're footy on anything other than the softest of surfaces. Uh, they might not necessarily be able to grow much wall height um especially you know thoroughbred types you know, thoroughbreds do get insulin resistance as well um it's just not as common um and you know it's it's really interesting like when we we're not a hundred percent sure as a scientific as a scientific community what the mechanism of action is for insulin causing laminitis it's not well understood at all right but um, you know, at uh, Charles Sturt University, uh, Katie Asplin did a study in 2007 where she, you know, the team, not just Katie, they induced laminitis in clinically normal ponies using um, like a, a, an infusion um, where it was like normal glucose levels but high insulin levels they infused in these ponies. So they didn't use glucose to induce laminitis, they just used the insulin to induce laminitis. And every single one of those ponies got laminitis, um, clinical laminitis. So we know that hyperinsulinemia, which is, you know, high levels of insulin cause laminitis. We know that this is well documented. We think that, um, you know, we've got a few leads on why this is the case, why it causes it. So it's thought that high insulin levels causes laminitis via, you know, a decrease in the blood perfusion throughout the foot. And initially we did think it was just a lack of carbohydrate it caused, you know, cell death in the lamina, but they don't actually think that that is the case anymore. Um, we're still not sure what the, what the link is there with the lower blood, blood flow, you know, the reduced perfusion of blood in the foot. Um, we, but there's vascular changes in, associated in the foot with high insulin levels, so it's got to, there's got to be a link there. There's also particular enzymes that are released during um, high insulin, like hyperinsulinemia, uh, that attack, basically attack the basement membrane and destroy the tissue in the lamina. There, there's like yeah, it's, it's it's a negative enzymatic activity, um, which causes a lot of damage. And then once there's already inflammation in the foot, it um, you know it. It's, it's localized in the hoof and it's caused by white blood cells entering the hoof and causing further inflammation and damage. So it's like a, it's, 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 it's a horrible cycle leading on to a clinical episode of laminitis for these guys. To diagnose insulin resistance in horses, it, like a good, a good trimmer or farrier should recognize the signs and direct you as an owner to get testing done or to have, um, or at least make some management changes uh, to, you know, it, it's not going to, I'll move on to trip management in the future, like in, like in a minute. Um, however, like no horse is going to be negatively affected by, um, you know, being treated as if they are insulin resistant or, you know, that, you know, they don't, they don't tolerate carbohydrates well. So assessment of the clinical signs is an indicator that testing is required. So a vet will normally, they'll, they'll hardly ever diagnose insulin resistance just because a horse looks like it has insulin resistance. Um, the best practice is to test it and not just diagnose on symptoms alone because insulin resistance shares symptoms with other metabolic causes of laminitis, which I'll go into in future episodes of the podcast, such as um, PPID, which is also known colloquially as Cushing's disease. Uh, and Cushing's has got a different treatment than insulin resistance in horses. It's really important that we differentiate 
and make sure that, it, that the horse is insulin resistant rather than having PPRD. Um, for suspected insulin resistant horses, the glycemic status is it, sorry, I thought my phone was ringing. It's, it's a, the glycemic status is a useful tool for determining the severity of the disease. Um, and it's, you know, because it, it can act as a benchmark for future testing as well that may be done to monitor the horse's response to treatment and management, you know. Um, I've got, like, there's a bunch of different tests that a vet can do, and it depends on, you know, this, the horse's symptoms and how sensitive the testing needs to be and how subtle the, the signs of insulin resistance are. Um, but basically, you know, they can use, they basically, the te okay, the test will look for insulin levels or look at, um, you know, the reaction to glucose or a combination of the two. Um, and it's basically looking at insulin dysregulation. It's looking at the hormonal profile and, and how the body reacts to a glucose infusion. So you can do just basically take a blood sample and see what your insulin levels are. It's your basic test. And you can also do an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, I guess it's kind of similar if you've ever been pregnant or known someone that's pregnant when you've got to go and do the, um, the disgusting syrup, thick syrupy uh, lemonade test with all the blood tests to check for um, gestational diabetes. It's similar to that. So, you know, they're given a, um, a oral glucose and, you know, you're testing the insulin um, the insulin response to that at, at various intervals. There's the combined glucose insulin test as well, which combines, you know, the two like testing for glucose, testing for insulin, da da da. Um, you can do frequently sampled insulin modified intravenous glucose tolerance tests, um, which are even more involved and it's and it's looking at that over time, like looking at the body's response over a period of time. That's probably like the gold standard of testing. Most vets will just do either an insulin um, concentration test or they'll do a basic oral glucose tolerance test. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time that's fine, but it's not particularly sensitive. It'll show it up if the horse is quite clearly having an insulin resistance issue, but it, it, it might not be sensitive enough to pick up subtle signs. So say your horse is just slightly subclinically laminitic, you know, go sore after a little bit of, a, after a trim, you know, you're not, you know, he's not moving forward confidently. You might try, you might test for insulin resistance, but that might not be like the insulin levels might not be high enough or, you know, I don't know. There can be issues with, the, with with just the basic tests. So sometimes for for those subtly like those subtle changes, you need to go on and do the more involved tests. But that, like that's something to discuss with the vet. And obviously, the more involved the testing, the more expensive. Uh, but if insulin resistance is your problem, and your vet says off the basic testing that you know that the horse doesn't look like it has insulin resistance, and then you go on for a number of years thinking my horse is not insulin resistant, it's fine you know, you may end up with a horse that, um, you know, it's better to, to start treating and managing it earlier rather than later, right? I also found a very interesting study um, looking at microRNA. So different microRNA profiles exist between insulin sensitive and insulin resistant type horses. Um, and it, it's, it's not commonly used as yet at all, but it may help find horses that are genetically prone to insulin resistant. In oh dear, I just had a smash. Genetically prone to insulin resistance, but might not necessarily um, be, you know, uh, sorry, I'm very distracted. I'm gonna have to pause this. Okay, sorry about that. Where was I? Um, we were talking about microRNAs, were we? So, <sighs> yes, so not commonly used yet, but could find, help find uh, horses that are genetically prone to insulin re resistance. So it's a little bit exciting. Now, the last thing I'll say about testing is, um, you know, some people say that you need to fast the horse before testing. Other people say you don't need to fast the horse before testing. Now, fasting before insulin testing um, is a human procedure. Sorry, if you can hear that background noise, my husband's vacuuming up the glass. Um, 
So yes, yeah, so, so fasting before insulin testing is a human procedure because humans eat meals, you know, and therefore insulin spikes are normal for humans. Horses are continuous feeders and, you know, they should have constant or fairly consistent levels of insulin as long as there's no change in the feed source. So fasting horses before testing can skew results due to stress related um, to, you know, withholding the feed, which, you know, will increase cortisol, increase glucose, you know, cause problems with your glucose and insulin response, right? So the best practice is to test early in the day after the horse has had access to its normal pasture or normal hay, but don't, don't feed it any meals. Don't feed your horse any meals before testing. So if you could get your horse to the vet or have the vet come and visit you, you know, first thing in the morning, that you're going to get a more accurate representation of, of what's going on with your horse. Treatment and management. So treatment should be focused on managing the laminitis if present first and foremost, because that's your most painful um, symptom. That's your most painful and your most immediate problem. And then after you've got your laminitis, um, you know, handled, then, you know, you need to be focusing your treatment on increasing insulin sensitivity, stimulating uptake of glucose, uh, slowing the rate of carbohydrate absorption in the digestive system, you know, and reducing obesity or, you know, and or reducing damaging inflammatory and enzyme activity, right? So, um, well, initially, if you're having a horse with, and, you know, I'll go into a full laminitis episode in the future. However, you know, we'll talk about it here. So, um, when you're trying to handle your laminitis, uh, you can use cryotherapy or icing of the hooves to, to take care of that. So ideally, it's continuous ice water in an acute laminitis, not a chronic laminitis, an acute laminitis where you're expecting laminitis to occur, right? Um, continuous ice water for up to seven days from the suspected onset of laminitis. So uh, literally standing your horse tied in ice buckets and they did this um uh the humble hoof did an awesome podcast on laminitis with dr van epps that i would highly recommend you go and listen to so he talks a bit about um cryotherapy there uh, and he's put out a couple of papers on it as well which um I can, i'm going to link all my sources in the, in the show notes um if it's not achievable for your horse to be standing in ice for seven days straight, because let's be honest, that's a hospital situation, a veterinary hospital situation. It should really be a minimum of 20 minutes twice a day. And that's like, that's arguable whether that's going to achieve much. Um, you know, you could even put your horse in, you know, for, to get them to stand in ice water for longer. You can um, put your horse on sand, let the sand down, put ice on the sand and have your horse stand in a small area of, you know, on the sand, because the sand will hold that ice, that coolness, uh, especially if it's, in the, if, if it's in the shade for longer. So that's a good way of doing it rather than standing your horse around in buckets for hours on end. Um, hoof walls are unable to bear weight because of the tearing of the lamina, you know, so providing comfortable solar loading in hoof boots is imperative to unweighting the hoof walls for these horses removing them from a high carbohydrate source of in, in diet is important. And then, you know, you've really got to get on top of the pain relief for these guys for chronic laminitis or, you know, um, acute laminitis moving into the long-term management, you've got to have a short trim schedule and I'm not talking four weeks short. I'm talking two weeks short, right? Every two weeks, the horse needs to be trimmed as soon as there's any, you know, possibility of, of overweighting those, hoof walls we've got to get them out of you know the, the compromised lamina needs to be out of weight bearing um so the horse has got to be kept in hoof boots or some kind of polisher um i prefer glue polishers for laminitis management i don't like nailing into inflamed feet in my uh opinion i'm not okay with me me myself nailing into those feet because they do not like it they don't like it at all but other farriers do um, and have great success. So I'm not saying that it's wrong to do it. I'm just saying I don't like doing it. Um, and we've got to manage their diet quite closely. And I know I keep talking about having a diet episode. I'm still trying to pin down my nutritionist. 
So for our diet, so chronic laminitis and ongoing hoof care for IR horses does require, you know, I just said, short trim cycles. It's got to be a physiologically correct trim from someone who understands the, you know, the physiology, the pathophysiology of laminitis and what's happening to the lamina there, not just someone who's used to um, maintenance trimming. It, it, it is a different trim between trimming a laminitic horse and trimming a normal maintenance horse. I would never plonk a maintenance horse con, con, like with no laminitis completely on their sole, especially with no, like it, it's, they might be able to handle it, but long-term is that okay? I don't think so. Um, laminitic horses, they also can't just be plonked on their soles, but they can't bear weight on their walls because there's disease process going on there. Uh, so what do you do? You need to be able to provide them with, the, with, with you know, comfort. We need to be able to provide them with conformable surfaces to stand on. We need to be able to provide them with comfortable hoof protection. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, I've got a, um, a photo of one of my glue jobs for a chronically subclinical laminitic horse here. Um, it's a polyurethane shoe, for those who can't see, glued with some uh, acrylic glue building height, especially in the back of the foot because he was low palm angle as well, um, with some pink soft dental impression material in the, on the sole there with the, with the shoe on the top. And then I'll cast on top of that. That's my preferred package for these laminated guys. Um, pain relief will probably be needed long term for laminitis and especially if the laminitis is severe, uh, but a herbal pain relief like um, Devil's Core is preferred over a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like phenylbutazone. Um, Bute, you can have issues with, um, with the gut, with the NSAIDs and uh, like with long-term use. And there's also issues with, um, Oh gosh, I should do an old whole episode on it, to be honest with you. Maybe when I'll get my my friend we'll do that. I'll put that, I'll write that down when I finish this. Anyway, diet. The diet is where the main treatment for insulin resistant horses and the treatment and management is concentrated on because that's where you're going to get your physiological changes in the body that are currently out of control where you're going to rein them back in, right? So the diet needs to be, it should be a hay-based diet um, and you need to have the current NCIR. I'll link this website in the show notes because it is, it is an excellent resource for insulin resistance and other metabolic causes of laminitis. Um, it's, I'm pretty sure it's Dr. Eleanor Cullen's site. So I'll link that. But um, their current recommendation is, you might have heard the terms non-structural carbohydrate or NSC in the past. Um, that's fairly recently, though, you know, we used to say that NSC should be less than 12% or less than 10%. They've kind of updated that to say that it's the ethanol soluble carbohydrates and the starch components of horse feed. They're the, they're the components that actually raise blood glucose levels, which in turn raise insulin levels, right? So ethanol soluble carbohydrates just means like um, when they do uh, like... When, when scientists are kind of find out, trying to find out like the contents of different feeds, um, like, you know, your calories and your, um, or even, even just, not just feeds, but human food as well. You know, the nutritional labels, right? How they figure out what's in the nutritional labels, they do all these different tests, right? And some, some carbohydrates are soluble in ethanol, you know, ethanol soluble carbohydrates right so that's all that esc means it's just that the way they can um they they look at it to find out the, the contents of it so esc plus starch should be below 10 percent for these guys that's the current recommendation some horses are going to need even lower than 10 percent like eight or less with these really sensitive horses who have been mismanaged for a long time um like I said, preferably a hay-based diet. Uh, you're going to want to feed that in a small hole bale net, like a small hole um, hay net, uh, to slow the horse, like to to simulate, you know, grazing. I guess so they don't guts their hay down. Like I said, these horses um, don't respond to the hunger hormone to the you know satiety and the satiety and hunger uh, hormones are out of whack as well. So. Um, you know, you're going to have to, as an owner, you're going to have to uh, be your horse's, um, you know, 
you, you're going to have to make sure that the horse is not overeating, basically. Um, put in a hay net and if your horse is obese or overweight, you're going to want to feed that at 1.5% of the horse's body weight daily for weight loss. So um, what's that? So if your horse is a 500 kilo horse, divide that by 0 0.015 not divide, times 7.5 kilos of hay. I should have known that off the top of my head because it's a 500 kilo horse. But anyway, five, uh, seven and a half kilos of forage a day for a 500 kilo. So 500 kilos is like, like a, a 16 hen high thoroughbred, you know, so it's rather big. Um, maybe your horse is more like a 400 kilo quarter horse. And five, six kilos, you know, for a, for a 14, three hand high quarter horse or something. Um, that's the, that's what you're going to want to, that's the daily weight that you're going to want to feed for a, um, in your hay, right? For a horse that you don't need to lose weight, it's 2%. So I think that's 10, 10 kilos for a 500 kilo horse. Uh, I'm sure that's the case. Let's do the little horse, 400 kilos times 0 0.2, no, 0 0.02, yeah, eight kilos. Eight kilos for your little quarter horse there a day for maintenance of weight. Um, you don't want to starve these guys. Um, if Even when you've got a really, really fat horse and you think, get that pony off the grass, stick it in a dirt yard, feed it barely anything, please don't leave your horse standing there with nothing to eat all day long because they can have, they can, you know, you can get up, end up with ulcer issues, you can end up with um, stereotypies, boredom issues, that are, but you can and stress as well, just the fact that there's nothing to eat increases your stress hormones in a horse and that's an influencing factor in insulin resistance. Um, so they always need to have something to eat. Uh, and also the biggest problem is these guys, um, when they're breaking down the fat, the way the body will use uh, fat for energy, because this is why you want them to lose weight. You want them to use a bit of the fat around their body um, for energy instead of what they're ingesting. And that's how you lose weight, of course. However, if they're having to break down too much, they have a problem. Uh, what slipped my mind. Hyperlipemia. Is that what it's called? Anyway, um, basically where the horse can go into organ failure and die because it, the body cannot process the fat that it's breaking down around its body. It's a really important thing to have food in front of your insulin resistant horse all the time, even though we're trying to get them to lose weight all the time. You want to balance your ma your minerals. Mineral balancing is really important in these IR horses. Um, you could be doing everything else right, but if you haven't got your hay tested and, you and you're not, um, you know, filling in the gaps with your, with your hay uh, analysis, you can be feeling like you're skidding your wheels in the mud, like you're not getting anywhere. So um, get your hay tested. I know that can be difficult in a lot of situations. My area, it's difficult to get hay tested because, you know, you'll buy 20 or 30 bales from the hay place, from the hay guy, and then you don't even know if that's the same, like, we have hay shipped in from all over um, and it's not that common in Australia for hay testing to be done. Um, I wish it was more common for, for, for feed stores and, and for uh, hay producers to be doing hay analysis on their stuff. But anyway, that's, that's another, that's a whole other episode, but um, test your hay, fill in the mineral balance around it. If you need help with that, you need to, you need to engage the services of a, a professional equine nutritionist. I am not a professional equine nutritionist. I just know a lot about it and I deal with it with, um, what's it called, um, at uni, right? So I'm not, I'm not an equine nutritionist, engage one. Get them off the pasture, get them off the grass. We don't, it's too hard to control uh, sugar levels in the grass, at least with hay, if it's got to, if you can only get sh high sugar hay, you can soak the sugar out of it, right? We can't soak sugar out of grass. And while, um, you know, there's some management things you can do to limit the grass, the, you know, the, the intake of grass, you can grazing muzzles, or you can, um, you know, only turn them out during um, the nighttime hours when the, when the grass is not pro actively producing sugar because there's no sunlight. 
Um, so that's turning them out at like 11 p.m., midnight, getting them back in, 6 a.m. That can be a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, yeah, we can do those things and a lot of the time that helps. But if you get these guys, especially in the chronic phase of insulin resistance where you're really trying to get the horse's body to start working correctly again, um, just get them up off the grass if you can. Uh, at, if, not just if you can. Make it a priority. That's my opinion. Um, supplement magnesium in individuals who are showing magnesium deficiencies. Now, there's a great website. Um, called the gravel proof hoof if you google gravel proof hoof magnesium there's a lot of information that um that they've put on that website i'll link that in the show notes as well um i'll just write down that i've got to link that um and there's magnesium is extremely important in a lot of biological functions in the body body um sugar balance and uh you know with, with, with muscles and nerves and um it's too many to even mention. So um, a lot of the time, especially in my area, it might not be the case in, in, in your area or if you're listening and or watching from, um, but magnesium is definitely a problem in my area. So supplementing magnesium for those horses um, is can be really important. Are there any uh, medications for insulin resistance in horses. Look, we've had a little bit of a look at it. So there's currently no licensed equine medications for treatment of IR right now. Uh, however, there's been some investigation into medications. So metformin is a human um, type two diabetes medication, and it's been used in horses with some, some positive results with, on insulin sensitivity in these horses. But, you know, at a much, it's, it's not particularly bioavailable in horses when you compare it with humans. So it's not, it's not, it, it never really got past the testing stage. We don't use it in, in, in looking after that. Treatments um, tend to be herbal. So the herbs that you're going to want to use and you should, in, you should um, engage in someone who's, who's done a lot of stuff. If you're going to be feeding your horse herbals, you should be doing, um, doing that in consultation with a professional. So, but, um, you know, any helpers that you're going to provide to the horse, you know, are going to be focused around improving circulation, giving pain relief for laminitis, reducing blood sugar levels, increasing energy levels, that sort of thing. So a few different um, herbal treatments that are good that have been suggested in a few different sources are chase tree berry. That stimulates dopamine receptors. Um, which can increase energy levels and it will help with pain relief for laminitis. Cinnamon has been looked at in horses. It's meant to reduce blood sugar. Uh, it's, it's shown to reduce blood sugar in other species, but it might not be as effective in horses as, um, you know, research lacking in that area. But, I mean, it's not going to hurt. Uh, well, don't quote me. I'm not a herbalist, but, you know, it's, it, it is used effectively in other species to lower blood sugar levels. And then there's this... Um, Dr. Kellen, not Dr. Kellen, is it Kellen? Oh, I'm sure it's Kellen. Who did the book? Where's the book? Oh, I'm using the book to prop up my laptop. That's annoying. Um, I'm just going to get it out. Sorry, guys, who are watching. So um, if you have got access to Pete Ramey's book, Care and Rehabilitation of the Equine Hoof, it's an amazing book. You need to get it. I don't care if, it, if the scary scientific pictures frighten you you should be oh yeah it is Eleanor Kellen I should have just known that off the top of my head anyway get the book it's great so Eleanor Kellen excuse my video watches while I move my laptop um she has done a little bit of research into a herb and I had to google how to pronounce this um geogulin is how uh google told me to say it but I'm sure anybody who's in the nose is probably laughing at me right now. Now, it stimulates, um, it, well, it helps with laminitis possibly due to improved circulation. So it's got something to do with the nitric, nitric oxide in, um, in the blood vessels and helping to increase perfusion. Um, that's another herb that, that I saw cited a couple of times. That is just about it um what else do i want to say about insulin resistance i, I honestly i think that's it i this i've adapted this from my um my assignment that i had to do for uni uh and i just wanted to 
you know, give this information to my podcast listeners because I think that insulin resistance is, I feel like I see it more often than, like it's more common than we think, I think. I suspect that um, horses are prone to insulin resistance just as a species, not just like all horse. Okay. In my opinion, all horses should be fed a low sugar diet, maybe not as low as less than 10%. EC and starch, but I still think that all horses should be fed a low sugar diet. I don't think the horses should be living off oat and hay. I don't think the horses should be fed a high grain diet unless they're using that energy because they're in hard work, right? So I think we overfeed a lot of our horses. And even just yesterday um, at work, I, I was, my clients will notice I squeeze their, the horse's crests quite a lot. And because um, I'm monitoring, I'm monitoring their fatty deposits over their body um, because I think it's it's my job to note when something is, you know, when, when things are starting to go in a way that uh, the horse may end up with laminitis or be footy, even just footy. Um, so even just over the last few days, I think I've had three or four horses where, because we've had a flush of grass, horses are putting on weight and I'm talking to the owners saying, hey, can we start getting these horses to lose a bit of weight. Can we, you know, we, we make sure that we're not feeding them a high sugar diet. Da, 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 da. Um, thank you so much for listening to my podcast again. Thanks for sticking by me guys. Uh, and also thank you for um, your patience. Cause I know this one's a little bit late, but it's taken me a quite a while to, um, to be able to have the time to sit down and record this one. Again, if you have any questions or you want me to go into anything further about any of this stuff, uh, just contact me and, um, hey, stay safe. Look after yourself. Look after your friends and family. Check in with each other. I hope you're all doing okay. Not just okay. Like, I hope you're thriving. I know that no one's thriving, but um, if we just hang on a little bit longer, we'll all get out the other end of this, uh, you know, 2020 it can't last forever right <laughs> anyway have a good night oh, have a good day i guess guys and um take it easy